Another problem in the world of feature engineering is handling unbalanced data. What do you mean by that? Well, that's when we have a large discrepancy between our positive and negative cases in our training data. So a common example is in the world of fraud detection. Actual fraud is pretty rare, right? So most of your training data is going to contain training rows that are not fraudulent. This can lead to a, dis a difficulty in actually building a model that can identify fraud because it had so few data points to learn from compared to all of the non-fraud data points. So it's very easy for a model to say, okay, well, uh, since fraud actually only happens like 0.01% of the time, I'm just going to predict that it's not fraud all the time. And hey, my accuracy is awesome now, right? So if you have an unbalanced data set like that, you can end up in a situation like that where you have a machine learning model that looks like it has high accuracy, but it's just guessing no every time. And that's not helpful, right? So there are ways of dealing with this in feature engineering. Now, first of all, don't let the terminology confuse you. This is actually something that I got hung up on a lot at first. When I say positive and negative cases, I'm not talking about good and bad. So don't conflate positive and negative with a positive and negative outcome. Positive simply means, is this the thing that I'm testing for? Is that what happened? So that might be fraud, right? So if, I, if my model is trying to detect fraud, then fraud is the positive case. Even though fraud is a very negative thing, uh, remember, positive is just the thing that you're trying to detect, whatever that is. So beat that into your head, because if you keep conflating positive and negative with like moral judgments, that's not what it's about in this, uh, in this context. This is mainly a problem with neural networks, by the way. So, you know, it is a, a real issue that if you have an unbalanced data set like this, it's probably not going to learn the right thing. And we have to deal with that somehow. What's one way of dealing with it? Just oversampling is a simple solution. So just uh, take samples from your minority class, you know, in this example of fraud, just take more of those samples that are known to be fraud and copy them over and over and over again, you know, make an army of clones, if you will, of your fraudulent test cases. And you can do that at random. You would think that that wouldn't actually help, but it does with a neural network. So that's a very simple thing you can do. Just fabricate more of your minority case by making copies of other uh, samples from that minority case. The other way you can go is undersampling. So instead of creating more of your minority cases, uh, remove the majority ones. So in the case of fraud, we'd be talking about just removing some of those non-fraudulent cases to balance it out a little bit more. However, throwing data away is usually not the right answer. I mean, why would you ever want to do that? You're, you're discarding information, right? So the only time when undersampling might make sense is if you're specifically trying to avoid some scaling issue with your training, right? Maybe you just have more data than you can handle on the hardware that you're given. And if you have too much data to actually process and handle, fine, throw away some of the, the majority case. That might be a reasonable thing to do. But the better solution would be to get more computational power, right? And actually scale this out on a cluster or something. So undersampling, usually not the best approach. Something that's even better than undersampling or oversampling is something called SMOT. And uh, this is something you might see. It stands for a Synthetic Minority Oversampling Technique, kind of a creative acronym. What it does is it artificially generates new samples of the minority class using nearest neighbors. So just like we talked about using KNN for imputation, same idea here. We're running K nearest neighbors on each sample of the minority class, and then we create new samples from those KNN results by taking the mean of those neighbors. So instead of just, you know, naively making copies of other uh, test cases for the minority class, we're actually fabricating new ones based on averages from uh, other samples and, and fabricating them that way. Works pretty well. Uh, so it both generates new samples and undersamples the major majority class, which is good. So this is better than just oversampling by making copies because it's actually fabricating uh, new data points that have some basis in reality still. So remember, if you're dealing with unbalanced data, a uh, smote is a very good choice. A simpler approach, too, is just adjusting the thresholds when you're actually making inf inferences and actually applying your model to the data that you have. So when you're making predictions for a classification, say fraud or not fraud, you're going to have some sort of threshold of probability at which you say, okay, this is probably fraud. You know, most machine learning models don't just output a fraud or not fraud. It actually will give you some sort of probability that it's fraud or not fraud. And you have to choose a threshold of probability at which you say, okay, this is probably fraud. It deserves some investigation. So if you have too many false positives, one way to fix that is to just increase that threshold, right? So that is guaranteed to reduce your false positive rate, but it comes at the cost of more false negatives. So before you do something like this, you have to think about the impact that that threshold will have. 
So if I raise my threshold, that means I'm going to have fewer actual things that are flagged as fraud. That might mean that I uh, miss out some actual fraudulent transactions there, but I'm not going to be bothering my customers as much saying, hey, I flagged this as fraud, I shut down your credit card. You might actually want the opposite effect, right? Maybe I want to be uh, even more liberal in what I'm flagging as fraud. So I would, I would lower that threshold to actually get more fraud cases that are flagged. And fraud might be a case where you're better off guessing wrong if it's not fraud than the other way around, right? So you need to think about the cost of a false positive versus a false negative and choose your thresholds accordingly.